Let's go, break it down, put it there, bring it on, step it up, right there, break it down, put it there, here we go, step it up, bring it on, let's go, uh. All right, we are live. Welcome everyone and welcome to this live online lecture, Politics of the Pandemic, organized by Studium Generale of the Eindhoven University of Technology. Um, and welcome to our third live online lecture today. Um, my name is Gijs van der Zande and I'm one of the program makers for Studium Generale. Nice that you are watching. Uh, of course, I can't see you. So uh, to create a little bit of a bond and an interaction with our audience, with you, um, I have a question for you and it would be nice if you could answer this question. And my question for you is, uh, who is your favorite politician at the moment? And you can uh, answer this question uh, on YouTube in the chat and on Facebook in the comments. So let's have a look at my second screen to see what is going on there, uh, to see what's happening in the live stream, to see your comments and answers to the question. Okay, so um, today we're going to discuss what the current pandemic means for uh, political leadership in the world. Um, what is the impact of the extraordinary measures politicians must uh, take, um, measures that they have to take uh, on, and what the impact is on the fundamental freedoms of citizens uh, in democracies. And the other question, uh, does the corona crisis boost the rise of authoritarian politics? and authoritarian leadership, a development that has already started before the corona outbreak. Uh, these are questions our guest speaker of today, Casper Thomas, will address. Casper um, Thomas is a journalist who works uh, at the Dutch current affairs weekly, De Groene Amsterdammer. Um, he's the author of the book, The, Author the Authoritarian Temptation on the Rise of the Anti-Liberal World Order. Uh, it's a book that investigates the appeal of authoritarian leaders and illiberal democracies. And Casper Thomas currently lives in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, in Washington, D.C., where he works as a U.S. correspondent for both the Groene Amsterdammer and het Financiële Dagblad, which is a Dutch newspaper. Um, yeah, so let's go live to the capital in the USA. Uh, Kasper, very welcome. Welcome to our program. Thank you very I much. hope you can hear me. Uh, I can hear you very well. Yeah, okay. Now I can hear you too. So that's going good. Um, yeah, how is life for you in these corona times? Yeah, li life is a bit different now if you're, if you're a correspondent here in, in, in the United States. Normally, um, you would go out all the time. You would travel the country. You would visit places uh, to go and interview people to ask them their opinions on current developments in the United States, you would interview people who, who deal in, with politics, who work at the university, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but now, obviously, because of the corona crisis, that whole has gone a bit, become a bit, bit more difficult in the, um, approaching somebody on the street and saying, hey, how are you? Uh, I can ask you a few questions has become much more difficult. Um, yeah. and, and of course, traveling also involves the risk of contagion. Um, so, yeah. like your lectures here at, at, at Studium Generale, uh, uh, a lot more is done <coughs> excuse me, online. At the same time, sometimes you have to go out, uh, take the car, drive somewhere, um, because the United States is bigger than Washington DC. So, yeah, I, of course, I try yeah, to get much, out whenever I can, bigger. but it's, yeah. it's become much more difficult. Yeah. And what are the, are the restrictions the same as here in the Netherlands, or a bit more severe? Or? Um, they're pretty much the same. It really differs per state. At the moment that we're speaking now, some states in the United States, like Texas, for instance, has already reopened in the sense that many new many businesses are are, are back back on back in operation. Yeah. Um, so it, it it differs per state. One thing that is different, um, I would say, but uh, or maybe I've missed this in the Netherlands. I I, I know. Yeah. If I go to the supermarket here, um, there's somebody from the army and there's somebody from the police who checks whether not too many people go in. Everybody wears a face mask and keeps okay. a distance. So in that sense, the measures are really enforced. Yeah, that's a big difference with how it's uh, happening here, how the situation is here. Um, 
Well, I invited you for a lecture, so uh, I won't make it an interview for now. So let's go on with uh, your lecture. And for uh, everyone who is uh, watching, if you have any questions uh, during the lecture of Casper, it's a 20 minutes uh, lecture. You can uh, put your questions already in the chat on YouTube or in the comments on Facebook. And then we will uh, discuss the questions after the lecture. So for now, please your attention for the lecture of Kasper Thomas. Thank you so much again. So yeah, thanks so much for having me all the way from DC. Um, as mentioned, I, I work here as a correspondent for uh, two publications, Groene Amsterdammer and Het Financiële Dagblad, which also means I think we'll be talking about the United States quite a lot in this lecture. That is currently my natural frame of reference, what is going on in the White House, what is going on in, in the US. Um, but at the same time, I think we'll be branching out over the world and, and look at leadership in these crisis time a bit more globally. Um, and why are we talking about this? Because crises, like the, ones we, like the one we are going through now, are times of exceptional politics. Because political leaders in every type of political system, whether they're strong democracies or less strong democracies, they all have to rely on extraordinary measures to contain the crisis. And then I'm not just talking about measures to prevent the spread of the virus, for instance, like containing people at home or, or closing businesses. There's also the economic fallout that comes out of these things. It's many governments all over the world are, are introducing very large economic stimulus packages, for instance, or directly giving money to people, which is they're doing now in the US, which is uh, first and has, has turned the US at the moment at the mo as the most socialist country uh, it's, it's ever been in its entire history. So these exceptional times also do an exceptional call on the leaders of countries. Um, and that's where it becomes interesting, at least according to me, because we live in a time where strong leadership, um, some would say even authoritarian leadership, um, has been on the uprise. So we actually have two different developments, and I'll be spelling those out a bit more in detail later, where we have a, 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 a world in which authoritarianism and, and strong leadership politics is on the rise, and at the same time, this world suddenly gets hit by this corona crisis. And then something interesting happens, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. I've divided my talk into three parts, um, very conveniently a before part, before the corona crisis, during the corona crisis, the phase that we're living through now, and I'll finish with a short outlook towards the future, which will be the world that comes after the corona crisis. Um, so yeah, let's first go back to the world before. So can I have my second slide there for the, uh, for the PowerPoint presentation? Um, and then the question is, do we actually even remember the world before? Um, it's, 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 it's two months ago, uh, roughly, that... Uh, Things went in lockdown here in the United States, and it's it's pretty similar, I think, in the Netherlands. Um, and in those two months, we've, we've maybe also even lost touch a little bit with the world that came before. But let me bring you back to that world for, for, for just a few minutes. Because up until very recent, we were living in a time where people thought politics was moving more or less in one direction in the world. It was the idea, especially after the fall of communism, that the whole world would be one big liberal democracy. The appeal of freedom, strong institutions, elections. Many people thought that would be at some point, what they say, the only game in town. Countries that maybe have, would previously be run by strong men or authoritarian leaders would move to democracy. And at some point, this global march of democracy would have been complete. And there's a philosopher named Francis Fukuyama um, who's written a book on this in, in, in the late 1980s. And he said, this is actually the end of history. The end of history in the sense that political competition, political battles between different systems is actually coming to an end and the whole world will subsume itself to one and the same system, namely liberal democracy. And what do we mean? We're talking about liberal democracy here. Let's, let's specify that for, for, for just for a short minute. Basically, the idea that everybody is politically equal and at the same time that everybody enjoys a large measure of individual freedoms, individual rights, which are protected by a strong rule of law. 
But at the same time, basically, as soon as this end of history was declared in the in the, in the late 1980s, beginning of the the, the early 90s, um, the world already started moving away from it a little bit. Um, because what, as it turned out, many countries did not move towards freedom and, and maybe even started moving away from it. Many countries adopted, say, the rituals of democracy in the sense that they had elections, elections, uh, a connection between a leader and, 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 and a political audience or a group of voters who really wanted that leader to be there. But they didn't necessarily move towards political and individual freedom. Um, think of Russia, for instance. Russia is, is, is a good example here. It was a country that, after the fall of communism, was thought to join the global bloc of, of liberal democracies. And I think we can safely say that the type of system under Putin, who had been there for a very long time, and, and as things stand now, might be there until 20, 2034, has not quite developed into the liberal democratic system that we see in the West. Um, Hungary is another interesting country because it's part of the European Union, very enthusiastically embraced the European Union, um, but now seems to be drifting away from the political model that's dominant in the EU in terms of the amount of power that the leader there wields. Um, India is, is a country which I also hold a special interest in and, and really qualifies for this in, because India was a very strong democracy after independence in, in 1947, but has now moved into the direction of what they call Hindu nationalism, where they basically say, no, we're not a plural state, we're a state which is there primarily uh, for um, for people of, of, of who, who, who practice Hindu religion and are part, could be part of that nation in that sense. Um, so we see actually that the end of history really never really came about. We actually very soon saw the end of the end of history because history began very soon again with these strong leaders being elected in, all these, in, the, in these countries that I just mentioned. And we very shortly come to the US, which is an interesting case in this, in, in this sense, because I've been wondering does the U.S. fit into this picture? Is the U.S. moving away from liberal democracy by having voted for Trump? Because Trump, as we can also see, is fits through the, 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 the strong leadership model. Um, he basically thinks the institutions are there to serve the president and not to curtail his power. At some point during, in the midst of the corona crisis, Trump even literally said, I think my power is unlimited. Everything I say should be listened to and done. That is not the idea that the founding fathers of the United States, for instance, had in mind when they thought of the presidency. So whether the U.S. fits into this, yes or no, is a difficult, is a difficult one. And I'll come back to that also a bit later. Um, but firstly, let me, and then I can have my, my, my next slide, please. So this idea of authoritarian leadership on the rise, I wrote a book on this. Uh, it came out uh, about a year and a half ago. And in this, in this book, I investigate... Um, five countries and five leaders that fit this idea of a non-liberal democracy. And rather than saying they're authoritarian, because they're not classic dictators in any way, like we've seen in, in, in the 20th century, because they've been elected by people, they enjoy great popularity. Um, so, and in this book, I investigate uh, Turkey, uh, Hungary, Russia, India, and the United States. And I group them together and say, these countries, they're democracies, but they're not liberal democracies because they position themselves against liberal democracy and they move away from it. You could call them illiberal democracies. And given the fact that so many of these countries are moving in this direction, you see the development of what you could call an anti-liberal world order. So in this book, I investigate this. And I've titled the book The Authoritarian, The Autoritaire Verleiding, uh, uh, Over the Opmars van de Anti-Liberale Wereldorde. It's a book in Dutch. Um, um, I apologize to my English speakers here, but the, the lecture today is, is a short excerpt of this. So basically means the authoritarian temptation, the appeal of the strong leader. That's, that's what it deals with. And that world that I describe in that book of, of, the, of the, the, the strong man leader on the rise, suddenly intersects with the time we are in now, which is the corona crisis, which I'll, for I'll take my next slide, please. And what happens when the COVID-19 outbreak came about? It spread over the world from, from, from China, 
and all of all of a sudden in 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 all countries whatever their political background whatever their political nature um we entered the time of what you could call hyperactive politics um leaders taking extraordinary measures that they would under normal normal circumstances never take for instance ordering people to stay at home closing businesses as I just mentioned in the United States, uh, uh, putting the police next to the supermarket to, to see whether everybody keeps distance and wears a face mask. So, plus the economic measures that I mentioned, very important, um, trying to bolster the economy. Uh, and these measures, they're, they're tricky measures in, because they require a great deal of, of, of trust and faith of the people that they are there, A, temporarily, and B, are not used for any other measures or any other goals than, than trying to contain the virus. And the interesting thing is the, the difference between liberal democracies and illiberal democracies, all of a sudden in the midst of this corona crisis, uh, it disappears a bit. Because no matter whether the leaders really commit to liberal democracy or, or to another political system, um, they take the same type of measures. So the, the, the idea that there's a clear distinction to be made between those is suddenly fading away in the midst of this corona crisis. At the same time, behind the scenes, you could say, um, there's a development going on that many of these illiberal leaders, uh, also the ones that I just mentioned, they are, they are actually trying to grab, a, grab more power than, than, than they had before. Uh, Hungary uh, uh, with Viktor Orban is, for example, is, is, is a good example. In response to the corona crisis, uh, Orban basically uh, instated the measure uh, approved by Parliament, where his party has a majority, saying, um, I can now rule by decree, um, people can be jailed for spreading misinformation about the coronavirus, and he decided to postpone the elections, um, which is convenient if you want to stay in power and, and, and maybe run the risk of losing because the coronavirus makes people unhappy or unsatisfied with the current circumstances they have to live under. Um, in Turkey, you saw a similar thing uh, where Erdogan basically started arresting people who um, were accused of spreading wrong information about the, 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 the corona pandemic, where wrong usually means different from what the government is saying. And if we then to sort of get a feel for it, compare this to, to the Netherlands, which is in many ways, I think, still a very pretty strong liberal democracy. Um, the sphere of ideas to discuss both the measures taken by the government and the corona crisis itself is much bigger. Um, in India, where we saw that Narendra Modi was already suffering from a huge wave of protest against his politics, also could use the corona crisis to say, well, if everybody stay at home now, complete lockdown, uh, don't go into the streets, which was a very convenient way of also curtailing the protests against his, uh, against his rule. In Russia, um, started claiming, say, this, see, now we see the weakness of liberal democracy. Uh, they're not able to deal with the, uh, with the outbreak of, of COVID-19. This actually proves the point that you have to have a strong central leader at the top of, of, of the country. Um, liberalism is weak. That's basically the point he made. And that's interesting because that's a criticism the illiberal leaders always have on liberal democracy. They always say your system is weak and not able to deal with anything. And to really deal with problems, you need this strong leader whose power is not really curtailed by any institutions and, 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 and checks and balances. I'll come back to that also in a bit, that competition. So anyways, the measures maybe might look the same across different countries. Um, I think the context in which they're taken matters very much. Uh, sort of the, these extraordinary corona measures taken in countries which were already on the path of illiberal democracy actually makes them move towards the authorita authoritarian direction more. So it, that's something to, to take in mind when you're evaluating uh, whether the measures taken by governments to, to contain the crisis, and these are measures are indeed maybe sometimes at odds with, with fundamental liberties. Um, but in evaluating it, I think the, the context really here matters. And at the same time, you see that the corona crisis has basically brought about a new battle of ideas. Before countries measured themselves against each other based maybe on economic performances or um, say cultural sort of me uh, uh, what do you call it criteria saying we have we have a, a stronger national culture for instance but now all of a sudden there's a new measure in town you could say uh, 
which is which system is better to prevent the outbreak of a, uh, of, a of a deadly virus? Is the autocracy better in this, or is democracy better for this? And here, China, for instance, is an interesting example um, because China has gone on a massive propaganda spree, saying, "Look, yes, we are a, a, a country with strong top-down leadership, and indeed, as you can see, we've been much better able to contain the corona crisis than the democracies in the West." In Russia, you, you, you similar thing you saw in Russia, saying our model is, is, is better in containing that crisis. Well, there are many, many caveats to that. And um, for instance, the fact that the, the, the amount of, of corona infections at the moment in Russia is, is pretty on, much on the rise. Um, and at the same time, you can wonder, is China's authoritarian or, or top-down model, is, is that really better? Um, yes, they might have been able to lock down a city much more effectively than, than, a, than a democracy could have done. At the same time, uh, the fact that the virus was there and there were doctors who wanted to report this in the early stages, um, that got suppressed. So the free flow of information, which serves as a warning sign for an outbreak, um, wasn't really there. At the same time, there's very stable and, 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 and well-functioning democracies who have also been able to contain the outbreak of the coronavirus pretty well. Um, South Korea is, is, is an example here. So again, it's, 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 it's tricky to judge and, and it's, 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 it's not clear-cut that the, 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 the strong leader and, and the, and the top-down authoritarian model is necessarily better in containing the coronavirus. And then the, the U.S. comes back into the picture, because that's an interesting country to look at. At the moment that we're speaking, it's got announced uh, the day before yesterday here in the United States, the Trump government is, is counting on up to 3,000 uh, uh, people dying of, of COVID-19 per day up until uh, sort of June 1st. Total number of deaths is now pro projected to be 134,000, which is more, if you think of it, than all the casualties that the United States suffered in during wars in, in uh, the post-World War II period. So the, the corona crisis is really having a huge impact here simply in, in, in terms of people that die because of it. Um, and then at the same time, the, the outbreak, it, it's not really, the, the curve is not really flattening here in any way. So this, this becomes interesting. The U.S. should be the strongest country in the world. It's, it was the pillar of this liberal world order that I, that I described earlier. But at the same time, it's not able to deal with the corona crisis and the outbreak of the virus very effectively. And that raises questions for the world that comes after, which is my final slide. Because... It's interesting if we, if we look at this, like why is, is the United States, as we, which we thought of in many ways as as a, as a strong democracy, why is it not able to deal very well with this with this crisis? And I think one of the reasons is is that one of the the features of an illiberal democracy is that it doesn't really like independent institutions. It doesn't. It also doesn't really like civil servants um, because what they do is they basically might do things that are at odds or might give a different opinion or have, have, a, have a different voice than what the leader of the country wants. And that is something that's very characteristic, you could say, of the, of, of the Trump administration. Um, it turned out uh, that the United States had a special department of pandemics. Uh, it was paused and it installed to deal with exactly the kind of outbreak that we're seeing now. Um, shortly after coming into office in, in 2016, Trump looked at the, uh, the structure of the White House and said, why is this office of pandemics here? Let's, let's just get rid of it. I mean, I, I don't need this. Um, and this, this is very, and if you think of it, an office of pandemics would have been pretty convenient to have here right now in the United States. And this is actually characteristic of the, uh, of, of the type of political rule, political uh, operation that, that has, has emerged here in the United States over the past few years, is that everything becomes focused on the leader itself. All the power gets sort of sucked to the top and all the things that would maybe sort of advise the power, um, inform the power, or maybe even curtail the power, um, are being done away with. Um, and on one hand, that looks pretty strong in the sense that there's, there's a short line between the political decision and it carrying out. Uh, it, it doesn't get messy, it doesn't get complicated because it's clear, it's the leader who's doing it. 
At the same time, you see that a dismantled democracy where all these independent institutions, etc., etc., are being taken away is actually less strong when it's, when it's tested in a time of crisis uh, as, as we are seeing now. And, like, and, and, and the, why the US is, is a good example of this is because it's sort of, it was teetering on the brink of, on the one hand, moving in the, the direction of illiberalism with Trump, but at the same time having its long track record as a, as a, as a strong liberal democracy. Um, and at the same time, you see that there is a risk of, during these corona times, of illiberalism really turning into despotism. The, the, the case of Hungary I just mentioned, where power gets more centralized, um, is, is, is a good example. You see that many countries are increasing the, the surveillance measures they, they impose on their countries. Yes, maybe to keep track of how the virus spreads, but at the same time, once the virus has gone, will these surveillance measures stay in place? That's, that's a very good question. Um, and then there's the ultimate question in every democracy, and that is the question of elections. Because the ultimate measure whether a democracy is strong or not is whether elections are open, free and fair, whether they work, and whether they're effective in removing the leader from office if the people feel so. And that, this will be, I think, the ultimate test for many, uh, for, for, for many countries. If they have an, an electoral cycle, an election coming up within the context of this corona crisis, we should really be focusing on how these elections will work out. And as you all might know, uh, the US is coming up for elections in, in, in November. And the big question is, how are these elections going to run? Will people be able to vote effectively and show up at the, uh, at the ballot box? Or will the corona measures, which force people to stay in place, for instance, uh, prevent or hamper this? Will people be able, if they can't vote in, in person, will they be able to effectively cast a uh, vote through the post, for instance? So people in the U.S. now are worried here that the elections, the U.S. presidential elections, the biggest political show on earth, will be disrupted by this corona crisis. And how that pans out, I, I don't know at the moment yet. It's something where everybody, every correspondent here, every journalist here is, is on the lookout for. Um, but it's something, it's something to, uh, to, to keep an eye on. Finally, to come back, to wrap up also to, to, to liberal democracy and, and, and how can they sort of come out of this crisis. And then I think this corona crisis might actually yield a new purpose for liberal democracy. Because one of the problems liberal democracy had before is that indeed it was sort of losing the reputation battle with the liberals, you could say. Uh, the, the belief that liberal, liberal democracy is weak and not effective was taken hold even in those liberal democracies themselves. Um, so in my book I also make an appeal for liberal democracy to sort of fight back and show its worth and explain why it is actually at the end of the day the ultimate system to prefer. And I think this corona crisis might just be something to, to, to hold on to in that sense. Because, as I explained in this lecture also, it seems to be that a country with strong institutions, uh, open flow of information, and checks and balances of power, and, and, and leaders which are actually willing to listen to expert opinion and let themselves informed by separate and independent institutions who wield expert knowledge, are, will, I think, in the end, be better in containing the corona crisis and, and, and the outbreak of the virus in the long run. So I think that's a sort of a PR point that the, the, the liberal democracies and, and, and the liberal leaders in the world should really point at and embrace uh, going forward into the future. These are a few of my thoughts on, on, I guess, on, 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 on the corona crisis and, and political leadership in the world. Uh, as I said, one of the interesting things is, and this, this is also why my, my, my journalism has become more difficult, we don't know what's going to happen. It's, it's uncertain. Everything has been turned upside down. So the world could be in for, for a really big change. Um, and we're in the midst of this. But I hope these ideas and, and, and thoughts I've shared with you help you in also making up your own mind in, in about the, the type of world that we're living in. So I'd like to thank you very much for your, um, for your attentions. And I look forward to answering some of your, your, uh, your questions, which I hope have come in through the chat. All right. Thank you very much, Kasper. For sharing your thoughts and your view on this, uh, yeah, the political political leadership in this Corona crisis, um, I saw that uh, there came already were some questions in the chat and in the comments. Um, let's see. 
Uh, the first question was a question by Ahmed Tavis. And of course, unfortunately, we don't know for those questions the whole background. But um, the first question by Ahmed Tavis is, which is the biggest and inspiring leader around the world? Uh, that, that's 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 something I think people should really judge for themselves. It's 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 it's, I, as a journalist, you sort of try to basically dislike every leader a little bit in the sense that you have to be wary of of of, of what they do with their power. So I, I I tend not to really have preferences in that sense of, 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 of for, for political leaders, and I am I am worried, and and then that that's something that I can't can't deny that. Many of the of the most prominent leaders in the world at the moment, uh, and, and then I do think about the country that I'm currently reporting from, mm. um, might not be particularly conducive to to liberal democracy. Which I, as I also made in my lecture, I think is 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 a political system I hold dear. So it's it's I'm 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 worried in 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 a general sense about the the the, the, the democratic qualities of of many global leaders at the moment. Okay, so. Um but there's a lack of inspiration then are, are some leaders inspiring also well i mean i i think on the whole at the, at the moment democracy is in, in inspiring in the sense that it's it's able to do things which are really maybe adults with democracy such as forcing people to stay at home um but at the same time are able to do this with broad popular support so in that sense we can see that Many democratic leaders are able to wield very tricky measures in in a, in a sort of I think balanced and 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 calculated way. And so in that sense, I think that's like I say that's that's good for democracy. Okay. And the second question was: Do you see changes in uh, politics at the level of supranational bodies of governance in times of crisis? And that, that that's a very good question because. Part of this liberal that's a question world. by Tim Wiersma. Okay, well, Tim, this is that, that, that that's a good question in the sense that because part of this liberal world order of the post or the pre-corona world, you could say that I was talking about, also very much relied on these international institutions uh, like the United Nations, European Union, um, World Health Organization, and those were also really pillars of that liberal world order. And what you see is that they are now under stress on the great stress actually because many countries seem to be sort of withdrawing from the from from these international institutions and the case i have most prominently in mind is is the united states which was always the biggest they were basically i mean they host many of these of, of these international institutions they were the ones most pushing for them when they were first started in in the post world war 2 decades um but now the U.S. seems to be skeptical towards them, and 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 Trump's dealing with World Health Organization, for instance, is is the best example, um, or with World Trade Organization. There's a great distrust in 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 American leadership at the moment of of international corporations. So, and in the end, especially if you think of it, a virus doesn't know any borders, as as we've seen, and. So in a way, this time calls for much more international political cooperation, but at the same time, the direction seems to be going the other way. Okay, and then um, a question by Rolf Mackenbach. It's a question uh, also a bit to, de to define the terms that you use. Um, his question is, we haven't talked much about how we measure or define the degree of liberty slash authority in these systems. Could you go a bit more in depth on how you define these? Yeah, that's a, that, 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 that is again a very good question and, 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 and something that does go a little beyond the, 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 the short time frame we have for a lecture like this. Um, I mentioned the, the, the reli reliability of, of elections and, and not reliability in, in, of elections in the sense that you can go and show your vote, but that you can actually make a difference with your vote. And so that, that, that is one measure. And another measure is to what, to what extent is power that every leader in every country holds, that's, that's what they're the leader for, to what extent is that power curtailed by institutions, also the free press, for instance, is also a very important institution in this, 
So you have to look basically at the um, sort of everything that's built around the the the, the position and, and and the power of the individual leader, and that in the end of the day is is, is a good determinant on whether countries can move into a more authoritarian direction or whether they're still strongly grounded into into liberal democracy. And what you then because what you always see is that the leaders who who have illiberal tendencies. They try to sort of chip away at this set of institutions that curtail their power. Um, they they try to sort of install um, maybe judges in, in in the courts which are more favorable to them, for instance, or they try to change the electoral system in such a way that benefits them. So as soon as leaders start meddling with the with the set of independent institutions and showing distrust against them, that's also very important. Trump's incessant talking about the the, the fake news media as an example of this. Um, those are sort of warning signs, you could say. Okay, thank you for explaining. I hope it's more clear for Rolf. Yeah, there, there's a lot more to say about this, and 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 obviously, libraries of books have been written on this. So, so I hope within the limited time that we have, that 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 sort of gives some 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 something to hold on to. Yeah. Um, interesting question about uh, protests. Uh, a question by uh, Jeroen van Tellingen, um, because yeah. We see in the news also, I thought yesterday it was in the Netherlands that there was also a protest against uh, the corona measures. Yeah. Um, and his question is, do you think anti-lockdown protests, for example, in the USA, are fueled by the government? Uh, and if yes, what kind of effect do they expect, uh, do they expect it to have for them? Yeah. Great question, because I, this allows me to, to, to share a small story, which uh, is something I experienced recently. At, at the beginning of the uh, lecture, I was asked, like, how, what is different for you now in the United States in, in terms of the reporting that you do? And one of the things that is different, I mentioned, is that I can't go out very much. But one of the, one of the things I did go out for was one of these anti-lockdown protests, uh, which took place about two hours drive from, from where I live in Washington, D.C., in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I went, I went there because I wanted to see what kind of people would show up at such an anti-lockdown protest and, and what would be their motivation to be there and, and what, would, what was the story they had to tell. Um, so I went there and um, I did not have the impression that they were organized by the government because they were very much directed against uh, the state government uh, of, of, of Pennsylvania. Um, they did have a political flavor, though, in the sense that there was a lot of uh, Trump Pence 2020 banners or Trump T-shirts, for instance, uh, at, at this protest. So they were they did that, that definitely had a had a political flavor. Um, but the most interesting thing I learned uh, at that protest and interviewing some people at the proper uh, six feet, as we as they they use in the United States, uh, different uh, distance, is that people basically complained. Not as much against the lockdown itself, but the way the lockdown was in, was sort of presented and carried out. In a sense, there's a difference made in, in many states in the United States between businesses that are essential and businesses that are not essential. And the essentials can remain open and the non-essentials close. And a lot of people said, like, everybody is essential. How can the government say the, these businesses are essential and these people? businesses are inessential. You can't pick winners and losers. That's literally the language that they used. So there was a, a, a sort of a deep fear of just basically being called redundant by the government. Um, and I think that sort of feeds into a deep sort of psychological problem here in the United States that which was also part of the reason Trump got elected in the first place in 2016 by people saying like we're being left behind, we're not being heard. So this also shows that also democratic leaders have to think carefully about the way they present their measures to, to, to the audience in order to have, have broad support. Okay, yeah, okay. And then a question related to this, a question by Lieke de Mare. Um, are you worried about uh, polarization in political opinions in the US population? Uh, yes, very, very much. Um, up to an extent that... that, that Many people in the U.S. who study this much more closely than, than than I could possibly do see a sort of trend emerging where, at the end of the day, it almost does, doesn't matter anymore um, what you think yourself or what your own views and, and, and ideas and convictions are. 
but what the other side thinks and how yours can be different. So there's a great animosity going on in, in, in US politics. And this is actually characteristic of illiberal democracy because in an illiberal democracy, the idea of making distinctions between friends and enemies is, is very important because it's also a way to sort of galvanize support for if you're a strong leader and you want to galvanize support for your, for, your, for, your, for your leadership, the best thing is to do to point out enemies and saying what's wrong with them. And the only way to protect the people against those enemies is by voting for you. Um, and that's, that's a process that's really going on in the United States at the moment. Um, the amount of crossover opinions between Republican, Republicans and Democrats is, is, is very low. So um, that is worrisome because elections then become a turnout game. It's all about selling IDs and having people vote for the best IDs. It becomes who can bring most people to the polls of his own, of his own team. And, and that effect of polarization is, is at really strong at the moment here. Okay. Um... Let's have a look again at the questions. And uh, yeah, you you ended your your uh, your lecture by saying uh, we can't um, we we as journalists don't know what the future will be. We can't predict the future. And there's a question by David Kohler. Maybe you can answer that question still. Um, do you think populism that was already on the rise around the world before the Corona crisis will gain momentum in the aftermath, or the opposite? Yeah, that very, very, very good question. Um, I think it. I, 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 yes, I think it will gain some in in the aftermath of the Corona crisis because um, every failure, big or small, uh, by governments in handling this Corona crisis will be used by populist opposition to point out the 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 the, the weakness of those of those governments. So it will. You, you saw it a little bit. I, I followed the debate on uh, in the Netherlands still, of course, uh, as well. It's not just not just U.S. for me. And one of the things that struck me is that part of the political opposition in the Netherlands basically positioned their uh, themselves when it came to the lockdown on as long as it's different from what the government is doing. So if, when the government was saying, well, maybe we should we should take it easy and 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 let's not go into lockdown straight away. Parts of the opposition said, oh, well, we should go into lockdown as soon as possible. And once lockdown was there, they sort of moved to the other side and saying, hey, well, we have, we, we have to reopen the economy again. So um, which reveals sort of what populism is. It's, it's, it's just being anti the dominant political force at the moment. And in that sense, it's, 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 it's less internally motivated in a way. Um, but at the same time, I think you can see the opposite is that if you say the counter-populist politics or the counter-populist trends might also be able to benefit from the corona crisis because they can raise the question to, to electorate saying, do you think you would have been better off with 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 this with, with, with the populist party in, in power in, 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 in this country for whatever country? Um, which I think is, is a legitimate question. Um, so I, what I basically see happening is that Everything that has happened during this Corona crisis, both in an economic and a public health perspective, will be thrown into the clash between populists and anti-populists. Okay, thank you very much, Casper. Uh, looking at the time, I think we well maybe a last question. Last um, yeah, uh, because you uh, said um, you can read uh, so many books uh, about this topic, and there's a question. Um, yeah, with regard to the library of books written on it, do you have any book recommendations for us? Ah, that's that, that's a great one. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, many, many, many. What, what, one, one of the books which is which is very good to read about this. Um, it's called uh, now the now I'm, 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 I'm drawing a blank word. Oh, yeah, it's, it's now. Yeah, I remember. It's the people versus democracy. Um, and it's written by uh, a scholar. He also works here in DC. His name is Yasha Munk. The people um, versus democracy. Yeah, the people versus democracy. That that's a good that 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 that's one I'd recommend to read. 
um, because it, it also deals with the world in its entirety when when it, when it comes to this question of, of of liberalism versus authoritarianism. So that's a good book. A more recent one on 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 the U.S., which I which I find interesting, which um, which is what I'm reading myself at the moment. It's called Why We Are Polarized. Uh, the person who asked a question on on political polarization um, might be interested in, in 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 reading that book because it really delves into the history of the United States, the recent history, and how this sort of chasm between Republicans and Democrats has, has come about. And for me, that already offers some, some, some new insights and, and it also offers some remedies. So Why We Are Polarized, written by Ezra Klein, um, would also be a, a good recommendation. Okay, maybe uh, we can uh, put those titles also in the chat or in the comments uh, after the lecture. Okay. Um, yeah, we have to wrap up, unfortunately, but thank you very much for giving this lecture okay. today, Kasper. And um, for the people who watch, thank you for watching. And uh, it would be nice if you could fill in uh, our questionnaire we have. Um, we will put a, also a link uh, to the questionnaire in the chat and in the comments. Um, it would be nice to fill it in. Then we can uh, upgrade our program for next time. And then you can also give us some uh, suggestions for speakers for next time. Um, looking at our uh, Studium Generale agenda for uh, this week and next week, uh, tomorrow on the 7th of May, uh, Thursday, uh, we have the program Into the Matrix. Uh, then we discuss the film The Matrix with Brandon Voss. And uh, next Wednesday on the 13th of May, uh, together with Tint, we organize a magical lecture on the enduring popularity of Harry Potter. So it would be very nice if you join those programs too. Uh, check our website for more information. Um, yeah, Kasper, thank you very much again for giving this talk. Uh, thanks to my colleagues backstage and people at home. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.